fix one. Okay, so today we're going to talk about retail <coughs> and chatbots. Very exciting technology, very exciting industry, going through a lot of change at the moment. One thing I do uh, want to ask, this is the first day that we've ever done a retail track, uh, first one at reInvent. How many of you are in here are from development or technical backgrounds? Yeah. Excellent. So this is a 300 level talk. Uh, we're going to dive into the code. So if half of you had only put your hands up, then we'd be in a little bit of trouble. All right. When we, talk, when we talk to customers, we see three uses for artificial intelligence. Three particular problems they're trying to solve. The first one is seamless experience. So trying to remove friction from selling to your customers across all your different channels. The second is really autonomous machines. And not just the drones that you see here, but how to improve logistics networks, how to do things like the iRoomba uh, robot for vacuum cleaners, and so really, trying to move the AI out into the edge, out into edge components, and finally, scientific breakthrough. So a lot of the technology that we now use in machine learning, things like clustered computing, GPUs, actually came out of uh, the science community. And this year, we also have an individual industry track on healthcare life sciences. So today, we're just going to talk about seamless experience and how we can improve our own customers' lives. So what is seamless experience? What we are trying to do is we're going to remove the friction points from when someone wants to buy a product from you, when you're marketing to them, when they're signing up for your rewards. And we really want that to end up in a great experience where it's going to increase their propensity to buy on your platform. And they're going to come back and buy the second uh, product. What you are seeing here is the Amazon Go concept store. And the idea of this store is really about trying to remove friction. The average adult spends five days of their life every year waiting in line at the grocery store and doing groceries. So we are trying to remove that point of contention and that give you back that time. So you can walk into the store, you scan your mobile, you pick things off the shelf, and we use sensors and computer vision to actually add those to your cart and then you just simply walk out. There's no checkout. There's no lining up. We have the system smart enough that you can put objects back on the shelf, and it will remove it from your basket. And we can also track the items that are being sold in real time. And so a couple of times a day, we actually change everything that's on the shelf based on how popular it is. And so with this concept store, we're really pushing the boundary of removing that friction. You still have to buy the item. You still need a retail presence. But we're trying to remove every other part of that so that you have a good experience. When you're trying to do this type of technology, you are going to need to use things like AI. You are going to need sensor technology. You are going to need to refit all of your stores. And so it's an expensive type of uh, journey to embrace. Hence why this is still a concept store and it's still in beta. Sorry. The way that we use machine learning in those stores understands the purchase patterns. And if we understand the purchase patterns of our customers, then we can keep optimizing that life cycle. We can keep stocking the shelves with things people want to buy. We can move them to the front so that they don't spend as long in the store. And we can improve the technology so that every time you put something back on the shelf or put it in your basket, we can actually record it. And what we're trying to do is to increase the propensity to buy. We want our customers to come back and buy the second item. But that is getting more and more complex because customers have embraced the mobile age quicker than they, we have upgraded our technology in retail. 65% of purchases are now made on multiple devices and across multiple channels. So your customer now might start their purchase online, but they're going to go into the store to pick it up. Or they might purchase it in store, but now they need to return it. 
And so they go online to actually figure out how to return that item. And so now we need more complex ways to interact. You just heard a single customer view in the last session if you're in this room. And so we need an omni-channel strategy so that we can give the customer the same type of experience across all the channels. And the consistent experience is actually something that's going to drive your propensity to buy. And if we make it consistent, then it will become seamless and we'll remove those friction points. And so our customers are going to buy more from us. And if we were to take the technology that is available today through things like Amazon Lex and through chatbots, then we can build a conversational bot to actually ease one of those types of engagements. We want something that has a speedy response. So when my customer is interacting, they instantly get a reply. We want something that is contextually aware so that they don't have to write specific words to trigger the conversation. And it needs to be able to interact with your current systems so that we can pull out what the return item was, what the transaction number was, and what the location was of the store that you originally bought the item. And so we need a full ecosystem to be able to uh, use this technology. So this is not, what you're seeing here is actually a language model. It is not text matching. You can ask it uh, several, different, several different ways to actually say that you want to return an item. You can talk to it and say hello, and it will actually respond. So what you're seeing here uh, is using the uh, iOS uh, SDK and, uh, putting, and using Amazon Lex in the background. We're going to dive deeper into this, uh, but first I want to talk about how we got here. Why are conversational interfaces everywhere? Why are people building technology around them? So in the first generation we had punch cards. Very specific to the computer. You needed experts to be able to write them. And they were very limited. And so we were doing, we were pretty much translating binary for the computer into something that was still hard for humans to read so that we could interact. In the second generation, we moved to pointers and sliders. So everyone's used to the mouse now, the touchpad on the Mac. We're still interacting with the computer in something that feels more natural, but we actually have to learn it. If you go and see a four-year-old pick up an iPad now, they know how to intrinsically use it. So it's not like a punch card, but it's still not natural. You're still forcing the computer to move somewhere, to drag something, to click something. And so they're not natural interactions that we would have with a human. And then finally, conversational interfaces. So we want to get to the point where it is as easy to interact with any type of technology as it is to have a conversation with someone. And to do that, we need a few different things. The first is that it needs to be natural. I'm up here speaking to you. Hopefully you can all understand me, although I am Australian, so I speak fast. The second is that it needs to be on demand. If I talk to you, I expect a response. It doesn't always happen, but you know, generally when you talk to people, they do respond to you. And finally, it needs to be accessible. So it needs to be in multiple languages. It needs to be in an interface that someone can interact with, whether that is speech or whether that is text. And finally, it needs to be efficient. So I used to work in an industry where we would build systems that would do automated IVRs. And people used to spend hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars on getting these right. And they were very, very specific about how you could interact with them. And they used to take year-long projects to actually build out. And so we need it to be efficient. We can't be spending thousands of dollars to actually be able to use this technology because it will be too big and people will not adopt it. So what is Amazon Alexa? Hands up if you've got some kind of Alexa device in your home at the moment. So if you're from North America and other parts, you might. If you're from Southeast Asia like me, not so much. And so Amazon Alexa is a personal assistant, originally launched on our own Echo device. Uh, but now we actually use it in other places. So there's connected cars that have Alexa now. There's watches. And so we are trying to expand the ecosystem. And Alexa, you can talk to Alexa in natural voice, and she will respond and she will also integrate with skills. We have over 15,000 skills now in the marketplace. So what I'm going to show you now is a short demonstration of Alexa, in case you don't have one. It seems like about 30% in the crowd don't. Thank you. 
Alexa, alarm off. Alexa, who's on the calendar today? You have 12 events scheduled. Alexa, call me an Uber. Your Uber will arrive in two minutes. Alexa, what's the weather like today? There's a 100% chance of showers. Alexa, pair my Bluetooth speaker. Okay, paired. Alexa, it's time to reorder some paper towels. Okay, order placed. And Alexa, play my garage music. Play your garage playlist from Prime Music. Alexa, listen jazz. Playing smooth jazz from Prime Music. Alexa, who's this? This is Picnic Basket by Lola Tone. Alexa, turn that up. Alexa, ask Domino's to send me my last order. Okay, order placed. Hey, isn't that Jason Schwartzman? No, that's not him. I would know if that was him. I'm pretty sure it's him. Okay, Alexa, who stars in Mozart in the Jungle? Stars include Malcolm McDowell, Jason Schwartzman. Ha! Ah, see? <laughs> Bedroom temperature to 65 degrees. Okay. Alexa, lights off. Okay. Alexa, good night. Good night. Sleep tight. Okay, so that was the advertisement for the Echo Dot, so one of the newer Echoes that we have released. And under the hood, actually, what you're seeing is the user making a request to Alexa using the command word Alexa, although you can change it. If you're a Trekkie like me, you can change it to computer. <laughs> the audio stream gets sent in, and we use natural language processing and automated speech recognition to infer the context and to convert that to text so that we can understand what you're asking Alexa. It then goes off to a skill. And so that skill is generally powered by Amazon Lambda. AWS Lambda, and we process that. So Lambda can call out to anything on premise or anything that has a public endpoint. The response, uh, there is a response, and this is the intent. So what, is it, what are we actually trying to do? Is it book a flight? Is it turn the light on? And so using the ASR, we actually pull that intent out, and then we return it. Now that we have the returned intent, we can actually do something with the customer. That might be that Alexa says something back to you, but it also might be that we use the mobile application <coughs> to actually change what the customer sees. They might have asked us for something like a wiki page, and so we can send that link to the mobile app. So if we could take this technology and apply it to our own retail customers, what would we do? And so to talk about that, I'm going to introduce Tim Robinson, our solution architect for Amazon, and he's going to talk through uh, what is Amazon Lex? Good afternoon, everyone. How are we today? Good. Firstly, it's a massive relief that so many of you are technical here today. I, uh, I thought I was going to be talking through pages of tech and uh, to an audience that perhaps wouldn't appreciate. We spent a number of months writing this software for you today. It's a fully functioning suite. So again, if uh, if anyone's got time afterwards and you'd like to sort of take a closer look at any of the code or you want to go over how any of it interacts, then please come and speak to me and we can, we can definitely do that for you. So what is Amazon Lex? What does it really represent? So Lex is essentially our service for building conversational interfaces to deal with speech and text. It represents the engine which we use to drive products such as Alexa which I think you probably know is being built into more and more uh, products and solutions which are available within today's marketplace. We're working with car manufacturers and also hotels to integrate what Alexa produces into a lot of the uh, solutions for today and also tomorrow. So Lex as a service contains um, a number of connectors to uh, allow us to interface very quickly with market leading solutions. We'll talk about that in a minute. But more importantly, for a retail perspective, uh, Lex allows us to uh, talk very easily to a lot of the other uh, native AWS 
uh, tool sets. So the ability for us to take Lex and via Lambda to talk to a number of different services, for example, DynamoDB or S3, et cetera, et cetera. And that allows you to take your basic chatbot solution and to expand it across, uh, across a lot of our ecosystem. Can I just have a show of hands? How many people have built a chatbot or had previous experience working with Lex to date? OK, quite, quite a few. That's really good. So. We'll um, just go through a quick video. I need new shoes to go with my jeans. What kind of shoes? Casual. Just casual. Here are some casual shoes. But apps that can listen and respond are even better. Amazon Lex from AWS makes it quick and easy to build applications that listen and respond using both voice and text. With Amazon Lex, the same deep learning technologies that power Amazon Alexa are now available to any developer. With Amazon Lex, you can build conversational interfaces, often called chatbots, into any application, cost-effectively and at scale. Simply provide a few example phrases and Lex builds a natural language model that understands all related phrases. You can log in and build your first chatbot today in just minutes with no upfront costs. If you've used Amazon Alexa, you know conversational interfaces can be useful and powerful. By maintaining context and managing the dialogue, Lex enables your app to perform complex tasks. Can you show me my sales from last month? Sure. Which regions? Southern region. Here are your sales for the southern region. Here's how Lex maintains context. Can you email me that report? Here are the top selling products in the southern region. Would you like me to show you the top five customers? With intent chaining, your bot can propose the next activity and switch to it dynamically. Lex's enterprise connectors support many popular SaaS applications, as well as custom business applications. And because Lex can integrate with AWS Lambda, there's no additional backend infrastructure to provision or manage. With Amazon Lex, you only pay for the text or speech requests that you make. You can build, test, and deploy directly from the console. Create multiple versions of your bot for powerful lifecycle management in a multi-developer environment, and scale up instantly through the power of the AWS cloud. Start building your bot with Amazon Lex today. Okay, so now we've seen that, let's, uh, let's take a, a deeper look at Lex and see what really makes the brain behind Alexa and how it's gonna allow us to, uh, to easily create that omni-channel experience for each of your customers. So traditionally, natural language processing is an incredibly uh, hard uh, problem to solve. We've got lots and lots of variables. As you can hear from my accent, I've spent a long time in lots of different countries. My intonation is going to be very, very different from each and every one of you in terms of speed, in, in terms of how we uh, speak, in terms of our sentence structures. Traditionally, developers have all struggled individually to try and solve this problem rather than working on what they really should be working on, which is solving business logic. From an AWS perspective, what we wanted to do is, is to give you a really nice model to work with so that you can focus on solving business-related problems rather than continually trying to reinvent the wheel. So what features do we have from a Lex perspective? Well, firstly, we have... Um, a console that's uh, integrated within the, uh, the AWS uh, GUI interface. Um, our solution uh, is targeted to both business and technical customers. And our interface allows the update and the, uh, the push out of code incredibly effectively. It means that um, individual chatbots can be updated, new versions can be created very, very simply and effectively. From a Lambda perspective, uh, Lambda interfaces very tightly with Lex, and what that allows us to do is to use Lambda in, in two functions. We'll come on to that in a second, but both from an error checking perspective and also from a fulfillment uh, point of view to uh, reach out to other services. Lambda allows multi-step conversations. So as I mentioned previously, when I have a conversation with you, you have a conversation with someone else, every single conversation executes in a slightly different way. 
Lex is capable of coping with all of those variables and allows us to take any conversation flow and to simply distill that down into a number of keywords or data points which we can take out and save somewhere else. Enterprise connectors are available for us, and we'll focus on those in a second in terms of what we can talk to and how we do that. More importantly, from a managed service point of view, our service is fully managed, so traditionally developers would have to worry about scaling any solution that they produced. You don't have to worry about that anymore. From a Lex perspective, we will scale your solution inv invisibly in the back end which means that a chatbot that you produce individually or at home can equally be deployed within the enterprise um, and will scale invisibly at the back end to cope with hundreds or even thousands of customers. So in terms of integration, we offer native integration uh, with all of our AWS tool set, but we also allow enterprise integration to uh, a number of different tools. As you can see from the right-hand side of the diagram, uh, we're able to, uh, to talk natively to, uh, to Facebook. We're also able to talk to Slack. So any chatbots you produce can, can be used for either talking socially from a Facebook perspective, but also from a, a project point of view. And also from an SMS uh, interface, uh, Lex allows us to be able to talk via Twilio, so our console allows integration into all three of those offerings. So before we start diving into code and examples, I want to take you through uh, a simple uh, flow in terms of concept uh, to how we would go about uh, returning an item to a store via a chatbot medium. So. We'll start very simply. Um, a user wants to return an item to a store and therefore talks to the chatbot, um, in this case, over a, a voice medium. Lex then takes that input and, uh, through the automatic speech recognition section of Lex, uh, pulls out a number of keywords. So those keywords then trigger uh, what we call an intent. So it knows from that intent or that conversation flow that it needs to extract a number of data points in order to finish the conversation. Those data points are within our chatbot, referred to as slots. So we continually loop around within the chatbot, the chatbot executing what we call utter utterances or, or command prompts. So we continue to loop around the chatbot asking or querying the user for different input. As soon as that input's fulfilled, a confirmation is sent back to the user to confirm the details. At the point at which those details are confirmed, Lambda is uh, executed. And once Lambda fi finishes executing or calling whatever uh, tool set you want to talk to, a confirmation prompt is sent back to the user in this case with a receipt number or a confirmation number, something of that nature. In terms of returning what, uh, what we had as input, we want to return some text. So in this case, what we'll do is we'll pass back via poly, which is our, uh, our text-to-speech medium, and then back to the user that we've processed your return. So what I want to take you through now is um, how we've uh, integrated Lex into Lambda and also DynamoDB. So we're going to uh, show you a, a video of, uh, of how we've done that from, uh, from the console. So as you can see, this is our Lex console. Got three chatbots here, so we're going to focus on the one in the middle, which is the reInvent Returns. As you can see from the left-hand side, these are our intents for our conversation flows. So we've got two here. The one we're going to focus on is called Def Item, which uh, models the return of a defective item. The operator assistance intent will come to a little bit later on in the discussion. So you can see from the top of the screen, we've got sample utterances. So 
a number of different options there that a user can pick. And again, we can go in and twiddle with these and add as we, as we want to. You can see the slot section here with uh, all of these uh, slots defined together with their types. And again, as uh, the chatbot goes back with these uh, particular prompts, in this, case, in this case, we'll highlight one, which is uh, the chatbot requesting the user's first name. Um, and then again, all of that saved back into, uh, into the variables that are colored here. So you can see a confirmation prompt here at the bottom of the screen, which is where we, uh, we go back to the user and just confirm that all the information that they've entered is correct. And then the fulfillment phase at the bottom. Notice the same Lambda script is called from both the initialization and also the fulfillment. And that allows us to uh, extend out to other tool sets within the AWS framework. So let's take a look at that piece of Lambda code. Again, if we expand the window out. Uh, this is Python in this case. So um, we'll just uh, drop down. And I'll just pull out some areas of interest within the code. So as you can see, the highlighted section here is uh, a check that we use to check a valid city. So again, as we drop through the chatbot flow, uh, you'll notice that we've got three valid store locations. So this uh, scans a DynamoDB table and uh, compares the user input to that table. And again, if, uh, if it's not an appropriate store, then we, we return a, a, a statement accordingly. Also notice the debug statements, which uh, will loop back into, into CloudWatch. Into DynamoDB, we've got two tables here. The first is modeling our store details. So again, a really simple table here, just with uh, city names and associated addresses. So if we click on one, we can see this is our New York store in our example. And finally, probably most importantly, our return ledger here, which will ultimately record all of the information from our chatbot. So what we're going to do is go into our test interface here. I've sped this up, so uh, we don't need to waste too much time. So we're going to uh, drop through the conversation flow. We're going to enter all of our details. So this is me buying a pair of jeans or returning a pair of jeans. We enter all of the appropriate information together with our receipt number. And then if we go back into DynamoDB, just refresh this table. And we can see that our data magically appears. So again, quite a good example of what a chatbot is capable of doing from initially talking to a customer to checking all of that data as it gets passed through to eventually saving it out into a, a separate table format. So let's have a look at the, uh, the architecture that we're working with. So in the example that we've just gone through, um, we'll focus on the, the right-hand side of the diagram. So Lex has been used um, via uh, speech or via language API to talk to the customer. And again, interface with Lambda for associated error checking. Um, once that error checking is completed, then we enter what we call a fulfillment cycle. So Lambda is then triggered yet again to perform a fulfillment action. In this case, or in the example that we looked at earlier, uh, DynamoDB is written to. Um, but equally, we, we could do something with S3 or Redshift or Elastic Map Reduce. It's also important to note that we're not just capable of uh, talking to uh, AWS native services. We're also uh, able to talk to uh, on-premise. So uh, via a public endpoint, we can talk to absolutely um, any system on-premise, so like a CRM database or something like that. I want to draw your attention to, uh, to the top of the screen now. Um, so there'll be situations, uh, perhaps for all of you, where you've got, uh, you've got websites currently, and you want to augment them with, uh, with Lex as a technology. Perhaps you want to embed a chatbot or something into a website that you already have. Oh, we're able to do this for a through a number of tools. So uh, we have uh, 
We have Cognito from an authentication perspective. We have CloudTrail from audit. And we have CloudWatch from a, a logging point of view. So those three tools we can, we can levy to uh, combine with some very simple uh, HTML to uh, give us the, uh, the output that we expect. So we'll take you through another example now. So this is an example of uh, how we go about creating a, a simple web style interface. So again, exactly the same chatbot that we've worked with previously, but this time rather than uh, rather than our test interface, we're actually going to uh, we're, we're going to pr produce something which stands on its own. So again, I've just pulled S3 and Cognito up to the top of the screen, and again, dropping down into S3. Scrolling through all of my buckets, and we'll find the appropriate bucket here. And again, we've got a number of files here, so we'll talk through what each of those files does and how they interact. So just a quick look at permissions that we are public for this bucket. So also important to add that we're not working with any web servers here, so we're dealing with S3 in a in a static web hosting context. So just uh, simply switching that on and then referencing the index.html. OK, so we'll take a closer look at those four files and how they interact. So again, the first one, nice and easy, just a a nice uh, splash screen with some shirts and a nice banner with reinvent for the top of our screen. And then we just uh, drop through the index.html. As you can see, the, the first head statement there just references the CSS file. And again, as we drop through that CSS file, we can see at the bottom of the screen just the uh, x, y coordinates, which is where we're going we're gonna to place our chatbot within the, uh, the HTML file. Back into our HTML file, and as we drop down, we can see that we, uh, we use a mix of HTML and also JavaScript. Again, the section that I'm highlighting here. Uh, is where we actually place our chatbot. So no, notice the bot name and alias, which, we, which we've uh, looked at previously. And again, if we look at the top of the screen, we can see how we interface uh, intercognito. So uh, we're able to produce a, a, a secure interface out to uh, the web. So what we'll do is take you into Cognito now and show you how, uh, how we generate this code together with the identity pool ID. OK, into Cognito. And uh, we've uh, created a ma managed uh, federated identities pool here. So in this case, it's uh, a pool that we call bot pool. We just go into here. And again, from the left-hand pane, we select the sample code. When uh, we create configurations within Cognito, we can choose a number of languages to generate code in. So in this case, we're going to select JavaScript. And you can see from the top of the screen where the uh, AWS credentials are listed, we can just simply um, cut that section of code. And then if we go back to our example, you can see that it's uh, identical piece of code from, uh, from our Cognito interface. So again, this represents an ability for uh, someone to work with very basic HTML skills and embed a number of our tools within, within a, a simple uh, index.html file uh, to produce a, a working solution. So we'll go back into S3, into our index.html, and click on our link. Make the window a bit bigger, and then we can go through our return item flow. So what I've done in this example, if you look at the uh, the blue text, we've uh, I, I've bracketed the state that the chatbot exists in. So at the moment, it's requesting more and more information, which we've called illicit slot. So it's asking for slot information. 
So eventually what we'll do is we'll drop down to uh, a fulfillment phase. So confirm the final intent and then we're fulfilled. So how will we go about extending this even further? We've, we've seen two examples of how we take a chatbot and we, uh, we create a basic interface out to, uh, to uh, a web style front end. Probably the logical next step is to do something with voice or do something with mobile. So we, uh, we have a, a tool called Mobile Hub, which is a, a fully in integrated development environment. And that allows you to, again, take just that same chatbot that we've worked with previously and embed into that application. We can also embed voice integration. So we'll just play a quick example here. So again, this is our chatbot we've worked with previously. So we'll go into the voice section. I want to return an item. Can you tell me your first name, please? Sarah. Can I have your last name now, please, Sarah? Robinson. Sarah, can you tell me what item you purchased from our store? A jacket. Now, can you tell me briefly what the fault is with the item? <clears throat> the wrong size. Do you have a receipt for the transaction? Yes. Please, can I have the eight-digit reference number from the receipt? Six three zero nine six seven six three. Sarah, can you tell me the name of the city where the store was located? Chicago. Finally, can you tell me the date that you purchased the item? December eleven. So as we can see, simply the same chatbot that we worked with previously, no additional code has actually been written, just working with tools within the AWS framework and we're able to produce yet another product. So again, how about if we wanted to extend this even further? How about if we wanted to uh, take our chatbot and now deal with scenarios where uh, perhaps a user wants to return something, but it exists outside of that particular conversation flow. So we now move into working with um, Amazon Connect, which is a service which provides end-to-end -end, uh, solution for call center management. It's essentially a, a, a fully automated uh, call center. Um, it allows us to create skills-based routing so from a flow perspective, we can create a, a call center flow and have uh, specific skills uh, distributed within our call center. So perhaps you have a call center where two or three of your operatives are highly technical and the rest are not. We can create uh, conversation flows within our Connect system to cope with that. Connect offers full call recording, uh, both encrypted and non-encrypted. What that means is that uh, you can sit afterwards, analyze calls, and uh, see where perhaps uh, customers are happy or not so happy. We also offer real-time and historical an analytics. So again, you, you can sit with a, a single pane of glass and analyze, uh, analyze all of your call center uh, statistics. But more importantly, we offer a very high quality uh, voice. So, I want to take you through how we would take our chatbot and then integrate uh, from a Connect point of view. So again, back to our familiar interface. This is our second intent called Operator Assistance. Really simple. So we just have uh, uh, an utterance within our chatbot to say that the user wants to talk to an operator. Absolutely nothing, nothing else within the chatbot itself. And then we load up Connect. So what we've done is create a, a virtual contact center. Log in as administrator. So 
So this is our front dashboard. So if we drop down, we can now open the contact flow for you. And then select our contact flow. Okay, so as you can see, we've got a, uh, a flow diagram here. So we start and then we move to uh, a prompt. So in this case, we're going to greet you with uh, thank you for calling the Tim and Sean uh, Retail Returns Department. We're then going to uh, get some customer input. We're then going to play a prompt. So again, this is where we integrate our, our chat bot. You can see at the bottom of the screen the, uh, the def item intent. So we're just going to add in a, a second intent called operator assistance. Notice that now gets pop populated within the flow. So all we need to do now is uh, take that connection and click and drag. Just to update our text here to say that uh, as an alternative, if, if we want to speak to an operator, then simply say operator assistance. Back to our chatbot, and then we'll click and drag down. And then up to the top and save and publish. So this now uh, completely integrates our chatbot into, uh, into our call center. So perhaps we can test it. Thank you for calling the Tim and Sean Retail Returns Department. Simply say return item to connect to the service. Alternatively, if you want to speak to one of our staff, Simply say, operator assistance, what do you need assistance with today? Operator assistance. It looks like the return system is experiencing problems. Let me connect you to an operator who can assist you with your return. Thank you for calling. Your call is very important to us and will be answered in the order it was received. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we don't have any operators that we can employed for today's demo, so that's as far as I can take it. Um, I'm going to pass you back to, uh, to Sean now to conclude, so thank you very much for your time. As I've said, if uh, anyone wants to come over and talk at the end of the session, then please feel free. Okay, thank you, Tim. So, in our uh, side jobs, we've been playing agents in call centres while we built this out, uh, answering calls on each other. So one of, what you saw from Tim uh, is actually, although we've been working on it for months to get it uh, ready for reInvent, it's actually about 300 lines of code in total. So that does end-to-end uh, -end the chatbot, the definition of the infrastructure, connecting to uh, connect, the uh, intents, and so uh, everything that you saw here. So this is the first retail, uh, the first retail session that we've actually done. So what we're really interested in is whether, you, uh, whether we can actually open source that and push it out so it becomes a packaged end-to-end -end solution. So we'd like to hear feedback at the end, so make sure that you fill out your feedback forms. Uh, we're happy to start uh, building some more of this out for retail. It's an area at the moment where there isn't much out there, uh, and so we want to work on that. So this is really talking about the seamless experience. So we showed here how we can remove the friction 
of answering things like customer returns, how we can then push it to our call center if our chatbot uh, can't answer. So we crippled the chatbot at the end of the demonstration there so that it will actually force through to the operator. And so we really want to uh, reduce the operational cost of doing these things that we have to do in our business. Just every single retail, retailer has some kind of returns policy. They generally have some kind of online and offline presence. And so we want to make the interaction with those seamless. If we do it with technology, it's much cheaper. We don't have to employ a lot of operators. We also don't have to worry about lots of people turning up to the store to do returns. So you can extend this out. You can do things like put the chatbot on an iPad in the actual store so that you don't have to get people to go to their own phone. Uh, and then integrate it fully into your call center experience. So you take more and more away from actually operators and put more into the, into the uh, Connect so that it will do uh, the end-to-end -end IVR solution. And so by reducing that friction, we get customers to buy more from us because they don't have a bad returns experience. They uh, have a nice experience where we know them as a customer. You'll see here that it was very personalized. We actually know what store you went to. We know what day you actually bought it on. And so we can use those things from your default CRM that already exists or from your other systems. The important note that uh, Tim pointed out there, so Lambda will actually call anything that has a public endpoint. So if you, also, if you have a direct connect, which is a private lease line from AWS into your data center, then you can also call systems online. In retail, not everything is moved to the cloud. And so you are going to have to connect with those types of offline systems uh, that are sitting on premise. And so you can do that with this type of solution. So you might just build the chatbot in something like AWS. You don't have to pick up and move all of your systems that are integrated into your retail network, which is generally very hard. And so we want to give you a solution that is actually usable uh, without having to go and do a huge uh, infrastructure project and migration uh, before you need to use the technology. So with that, uh, that is our retail on AWS. I am Sean Ray. That is Tim Robinson. Thank you very much.